let us quickly discuss an important concept. So far we have been handling variables and the only collection of variables that we are familiar with is an array. So in an array, you can put variables of the same type. So you can define an array of integers, array of floating point numbers, array of strings, etc., etc. But if you have to combine different types of values together and give it some kind of a single name so that you are able to address that single name as a composite variable describing all components and additionally you are able to access every individual component. For that, most programming languages have features which are called structures. So we shall look at structure definition and usage. In the object-oriented paradigm of C++, an object is effectively a structure. However, what we are discussing is the original C-style structure definition, which is of course still valid in C++. As I said, I wanted to discuss files in general, streams, file positions, binary files, and direct random access to files. These would be useful to you, not only for your project, but even otherwise. But we shall postpone this discussion to the next lecture. So let's look at struct. A struct is a useful representation which have many attributes of distinct types. How do we combine them together? Here is a simple example. Struct student info. So student info is an artificial name I am giving to the type of values which are represented by the conglomerate of the multiple components. Which are the components here? Cab name 31. You could also have said string name in which case the exact length would not have been defined. When you say cal name 31, this represents a character string containing at most 30 characters. Please remember, in this fashion when you declare a variable, you have 31 character positions, but the last position will always be occupied by a slash null character because null terminated strings is how you represent strings in this fashion. So you have a 30 character string here, but the size of this is 31 character, 31 bytes. Similarly, there is a role. We know roll number is 8 characters long, but it is defined as 9 because you have to have a slash null at the end. Then you have another component, which is an integer number, int hostel. Please note that this hostel is of a different type altogether than the type cab for roll or for name. Why are we clubbing these together? Because whenever you are trying to describe one student, let's say, then the student related information you would like to put all together and you would like to call a variable which describes the entire collection of all the information about that student. So far we have no mechanism to do that. So now what we are defining actually this student info is not a variable name. It is a new type that we are defined like integer, character, floating point. So now student info becomes a type. The type is nothing but the collection of these components. You can now define variables of the type student info, any variable s, st, student1, any variable that you define which is of the type student info automatically inherits these three components, name, role and hostel. We shall see exactly how these components are accessed and what does it mean to access the holistic top name which is defined to be of the type student info. So to recapitulate, what we are defining is a structure. Student info is the name given to the type of this structure. This structure can be defined for different variables. Whenever we define any variable of the type student info, that variable automatically inherits three components. One is called name, the other is called role, third is called hostel. And the individual component types are now clearly defined. First is character array, second is character array, and third is int. Let us see its usage in an actual program. Here is an example. So I am now saying student info s. This is almost like int x or float y or string something something. First thing is type, the second thing is variable name. 
So student info now is being used as a type. Obviously I have defined this type in terms of structure. So the fundamental thing that we remember is that whenever we define a structure, we are sort of defining it as a template and the name that we give becomes a new artificially defined type by us. But C, C++ can understand this because that is the meaning of structure definition. Now in my program, anywhere, once I have defined a structure, I can define any number of variables which are of the type student info. So whenever I refer to S, S is neither integer number, S is not floating point number, not a character string, but S is exactly a composition of three parts as defined in the structure. And to access an individual part, I use a dot. S dot name means a component of S which is called name. S dot role is a component of S which is called role. And S dot hostel is a component of S called hostel. So if I have another variable called student, the student dot name would be the name portion of that student variable. Consequently, I can now perform all operations that I perform programmatically on these individual components. Notice that S dot name is a character string array, effectively a character string. So is role. Hostel is an integer number. So S dot hostel is an integer number. Is S integer? Is S character? Is S floating point? No. It is neither of that. S is a composition of the three components that we saw. Again to go back, these are the three components of any variable defined to be of type student in. And the beauty is that you are effectively defining a new type which is not provided by the programming language. Programming language permits int, float, char, whatever, whatever string. But you are defining a new type, making C, C++ aware that this is now a new type name that I am giving. And therefore hereafter, if I define a variable of this type, then automatically every variable which I so define will have the three components which are listed under that structure. And I can do with individual component exactly the same thing that I could do with the corresponding variables of that type in my program. The way in which we access or refer to these components is always to say a variable name dot component. So has got name, has got role, has got hostel. However, I can also use the composite S. How do I use composite S? Can I use it to say C out S? Well, obviously not. C out will not understand what to do with it. This particular reference here which says print student S is obviously a function name which I have to define myself. So if I want to define all information about a student, then I have to write a function of my own to which I should pass on S as a parameter. So I can pass on a structure as a parameter, but inside that function, I should look at individual components and do whatever I wish to do with it. This is the main program. What is the function? Print student test. Let us look at that function. It says void print student student info st. Please remember when we write a function definition, inside we are required to write the type of variables which we are passing to that function. Ordinarily, we would have said int something, float something, string something. What are we passing here, however, a structure of the type student info? So instead of writing int or float, we write student info. Very obviously, student info should have been defined before this function is encountered. Will it do to define this structure inside this? Not sufficient, because in the main program also we are referring to this structure. You remember the scoping that we discussed once? we would like to have a global scope for some of the things in our program. Very obviously, structures of this type should have a global scope. That means even before int mail, even before function, you should define these structures at the top so that the structure definitions are incorporated and understood by the compiler when the compiler is looking at either the main program or the function. That is how the compiler will understand that when I say student info, I mean that ST is a variable of the type student info, which means ST also has three components. And all that I am doing here is, I am using a printf statement. Please note, I could have also used Cout for individual components. 
this printf is to mention to you that if you want a formatted output, each particular value being printed in certain number of columns, you remember that we discussed this pretty printing once and I requested you that you should look up the printf uh, statement and the formatting features. They are available in any standard textbook. In this particular case, I am saying printf, the first value is to be printed as a string in six characters, the second value is to be printed as a string in eight characters, and the last value is to be printed in four digit. Please remember that st.roll and st.name are individually character arrays of 9 and 31 characters respectively because when you declare a character array to store a string, you need an extra character position at the end to store backslash null. That is 0. So is this understood very clearly? Now you can see that while dealing with, let us say, a record of a student which is very long and which contains many attributes. It may contain date of birth, it may contain address, it may contain father's name, mother's name, whatever, whatever. You can actually have maybe 10, 15, 20 attributes describing a student. Now ordinarily, we had seen earlier how we could create independent arrays to store every attribute. And we could have one array containing roll numbers and the only connection between roll number and the other attributes would be through an index. So if certain roll number is, let us say, 27th roll number in that array, then 27th element of the names array will contain that student's name, 27th element of hostel number will contain that student's hostel number, etc. Suppose if there is any goof up and some array gets disturbed, because these arrays can be handled independently, then you could have a very funny situation where some roll number is pegged to some other hostel, to some other room, to some other name. To avoid that, it would be nice if you would combine all the information about an entity called student, define it as a part of the structure, and within that structure, you can have individual elements which refer to a particular entity. So this roll number, that roll number's name, that roll number's hostel, that roll number's room number, that roll number's marks, that roll number's address, whatever, whatever. From the point of your project, there is an additional information that you might want to include in such a structure. What would be that information? You remember you are going to collect fingerprints of that student. Now that fingerprint cannot be stored inside a structure like this very easily. Obviously the fingerprints will be stored in separate files. But if you have decided intelligently on naming those files, then you can store the base name of any such file for fingerprints as a part of that student information. So if one student has a file name associated with it, then you can extend the structure definition. You can have roll number, name, hostel number, room number, whatever, whatever other information, and fingerprint file name as a character value. The actual file may be somewhere else. It doesn't matter. It may be in some big directory. There may be 500 such files. But once you know the name which is tagged to that particular student, you can always go to that particular directory, open the specific file, and you know 100% that that fingerprint belongs to that student. If there are multiple fingerprints, you can have multiple file names in this structure, or alternately you can have an array of file names inside this structure. What is important to note is that structure is not limited to have simple components like integer, real, only these things. It can also have arrays as components. So this is an extremely important and flexible feature that permits you to extend the notion of collective groups of information all being given a single name through which you can access. I am extending this concept to suggest to you that you can actually write a database kind of program. What is a database? Typically you write a whole lot of information about different entities such as student, courses, grades, whatever, whatever. There is something called database schema which you define. There are database products and there are millions of lines of code that is written to have those database products. So in those databases you insert all your information. For example, currently all the students information is stored in the ASC database. 
the product that they use is called Oracle. There are multiple database products, as I had once mentioned when I described the packages. Such products, once you put the data into the database, you can extract the data by running what is known as a query language processor to which you give queries. For example, if you want to get all schools of Hostel 3, you might write a SQL query called select star from student database where hostel equal to 3. This becomes a simple instruction in a programming language called SQL. The SQL interpreter or SQL compiler will actually handle that query, go to the database, extract the data and give it to you. What I am trying to show you is that it is possible for you to construct a database of a simple file and write a program which acts as an interpreter to answer simple queries. So let us see what this problem is all about. It says write a program which will read the data about students from a database file called database.txt and will answer queries of the following type given as input. So there is a file called database.txt. Presumably this file stores information in text form about a student and we will limit ourselves to the information which we have seen as a part of that structure definition. But as you know you can extend that structure definition. So the purpose is that the program should first read this file and read all the data in memory. Because you can actually have memory arrays which can contain all students data. But anytime any changes happen, those changes should be reflected in the file. Because file remains permanently, memory vanishes. So every time the query has to be answered, your program should read the entire data from that file into memory and then answer those queries. And we are defining a new query language sort of. What is that query language? That query language consists of a query code followed by a parameter. So here is a query code, N. If I say L, it means I want the name of the student. And if I say 8, it means list names of HH students. If I say R, that means I want information about specific roll number. The parameter is the roll number. So full information about given roll number. If I say H followed by 3, I want all information about H3 students. If I say X, that means exit. You can see that the definition of M, R, H, X is completely artificial. I am defining it. You can define your own query language, your own symbols. J means this, P means this, whatever one. It need not be a single character symbol. You can define a query which is more meaningful. So you see the amount of flexibility that you have to creatively define your own queries and write programs which will answer those queries using the information which has been stored in the files first. It is almost like defining a new programming language and writing an interpreter for that language. Of course, the actual programming language definition and writing an interpreter is a big time task. What I am telling you is that fundamentally and conceptually, it's a very simple thing which all of you can do. And in fact, I would encourage you to consider this kind of query for the project databases that you will create or project files that you create. For us, database means one or more files. We know how to create files, we know how to read files, but instead of writing a specific program to answer one query, I might generalize and I might include the interpretation and execution of those queries in a generalized program. So here is an example. This is a sample program to answer one query. This, what is written here is called pseudo code. It is not written in any programming language. It is written in plain English. While we have not studied this way of designing algorithms, this is the most popular way in which serious programming starts. You don't start writing programs, but you start writing an algorithm or a step-by-step -step process in something like a pseudo language or an English-like language. I presume all of you can understand what I am trying to write it here, and that is the beauty in this simplicity. So what this program says, this is not a program in a programming language, this is a pseudo code. It says, read in the database.txt, then set up some variable done equal to zero. While done is equal to zero, read in the option. Option means H or X or R or whatever. If option is H, perform action. Else, if option is X, that is exit, done is equal to one, end. Now this is the simple kind of query interpretation that you can write. 
If you have multiple options, you can put an else if ladder or the switch statement. If option is H, then do this. If option is N, do something else. If option is PQR, do something else. And at the end, you get out. This is the program here. Observe that I have said student info, student list 100. This permits up to 100 students' data <coughs> to be stored here. What if I want to input data for all students attending CS101? The only thing that I will have to do is to increase this number from 100 to let us say 1000. What if I want to store the data for all students in the institute campus? Well, let us estimate how many students are there. About 7,000. Assuming that the program will be used for next four or five years, during which time the population may grow, it would be safe to change this to say 10,000. As a matter of fact, we should not put ex explicit numbers in real programs. We could say something like max student, which is defined as a constant. Because if this number is required to define multiple arrays, then by changing the constant value of max student once and recompiling the program, every array that you have defined using that value will automatically be recompiled properly. But it doesn't matter. So the point I'm making is that as per the structure that we have defined, we have seen how we define individual variables. I can even define arrays where each element of the array now is of the type student info. CAV option. It is assumed that the query language that I am designing has one character code. H means hostel, N means name, R means role, X means exit, etc. But you can easily change it to whatever you wish to do. There are some integer variables defined. I am now defining a file called input stream, input file stream, fin. This is the artificial name which I am giving. fin.opendatabase.txt. It will open the text file. Observe that my structure contains a value which is integer, some values which are character, there could be some values which are float, etc. But the file in which I am storing all of this is a text file. Why? Because it is easier for me to see the text file, whether it is correct, it contains correct data or not, etc. Okay. Of course, I could define this file to be a binary file. We shall see how binary files are handled in the next lecture. I am also defining a variable called S which is student info. What is the purpose? The purpose is when I read one line from that file, I would rather extract information about one student into a simple variable of the structure type S in different components. I would also like to answer query why I am reading the file, where well, I know what the query is. So instead of first reading and then again going through all the array that I have created and finding out the query answer, I might as well answer the query as I am reading the data. Ordinarily, however, this is not how you will organize. You will organize your program such that you read the entire data, stuff it into the arrays inside your program variables and arrays, and then start looking at query one by one. So you can answer multiple queries if you look at the data in the arrays rather than in the files. This is a simplistic program where I have written the following way that I read the data, and I also answer the query while reading the data. So let us see what I am doing. I first read the value of n. This is the number of students. Then I say for i equal to 0, i less than n, i plus plus. I read in the s dot name, s dot role, done is equal to 0. While done equal to 0, give your option. I read the option. If the option is x, done is equal to 1. That means I exit. If the option is H, that means I want to get the hostel number. I read the hostel number, I output the hostel number. Now, S is equal to student list I. So please note, I have read the data in the student list array. At any point, I am going through all the information. There are n students. So there are n numbers in student list. For every value of i, I am extracting the information from that student list and passing on to the complex uh, type structure that I have created and the variable is s. 
So every time I do this, this assignment is perfectly legal by the way. I am taking a complicated group variable array, sub element from that array and putting it into a, 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 a single variable S which is again of the same complex type. Once I do this assignment, S dot hostel, S dot new, S dot role, everything gets defined. What was my query? Query was that for a given hostel number, give me all the information. I will simply check if S dot hostel is hostel number. That is the hostel number which I have desired. That is the parameter for my query. So if hostel number is 3 for example, any time out of these n students, any student has S dot hostel as 3, that student's information will be printed. And I am again using the same function print student S. This answers the query, this is end of Y. So I can go back and again give another query. I can go back, again give a third query. When I say X, when X is given, you remember that done would have been set to 1 and the while loop will break, I will come out of it. So the point that is being made in this kind of query is that in general, you should work for storing your data permanently in computer files on the desk. Arrays are useful to store data temporarily during which time your program is executing so that you can answer different queries. But if there is any change that happens by changing the student's hostel number or room number for example in a memory array is good for execution of that program. But once the program execution stops, the changes will disappear. Correspondingly, you may also write another program which is called update database program. What does that update database program do? It will take any new information about a student and will replace the old information in the file with the new information. For that, there are two ways of doing it. One, you of course read all the student's information from file into the memory. Then you keep collecting update information about different students. Every time you get a roll number and let's say a room number change or a hostel number change, you make that change in the corresponding arrays. And after all changes are collected, you recreate that file, you rewrite the entire file with the new information. That is one way. The second way is that if you are going to update an individual student some information for a few students, why do you want to read the entire information about all students? Why not go directly to the file, to the place where that student's information is stored and update that information in place? That is, treat the disk as if it is an array of bytes, provided you know exactly which byte to update to change the roll number or which bytes to update to change the hostel number, you will be able to correctly update that directly onto the file. This is what we are going to discuss when we discuss random access files and binary files. Unfortunately, this discussion has to happen in the next lecture. So we will have to close this, but this is the direction I would like you to take while you design your file formats and so on. Thank you.